द प्रिंट ऑफ द कफ कॉपरेट पार्टनर ए यू स्मॉल फाइनेंस बैंक हेलो एंड वेलकम टू दिस एपिसोड ऑफ ऑफ द कफ आई टी सी ए शरद राघवन डेप्यूटी एडिटर एट द प्रिंट एंड दिस टाइम आर गेस्ट इज एब्सोल्युटली फैसिनेटिंग इट्स डॉक्टर सुरजीत भल्ला नाउ फॉर दोज फ्यू हु डोंट नो हिम ही इज अ नोटेड इकोनॉमिस्ट ही इज नोन फॉर बींग अ स्ट्रेट शूटर ही अटैक्स द गवर्नमेंट एज मच एज ही अटैक्स इट्स क्रिटिक्स because his arguments are data backed every single time it's not rhetoric it's fact and now apart from that he has been executive director at the IMF he's also been a member of the prime minister's economic advisory group and so he's really well versed with government policies international views of how india is doing and of course all of the data within india So thank you so much sir for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. So sir uh, uh I'll start with there's a lot of politics that's happening right now around the economy. There's a white paper here, there's a black paper there and uh, but before all of that you had actually written an article for the print where you talked about the growth rates during the UPA and during the Modi government and how both should be looked at in relation to global growth. Yes. so could you tell us a little more about that yeah actually you know that was prompted more by the fact that <clears throat> in the modi period you had possibly the greatest shock to the world economy right which was the covid shock mm-hmm. i don't recall a single instance other than world war 2 and prior to that uh, <clears throat> the spanish flu right now and this has to do with data and the polarization etc there were economists serious economists editors arguing that we should compare the modi government uh rule the modi government period with the upa period i think that's absolutely essential right how else is a voter going to choose who was better who was not on the basis at least on the economy right now these very same people are also arguing that you cannot exclude the covid year okay okay so the first point about that analysis is that you know cadres paribus as us economists know all other things being equal etc and most of the time all other things are equal in comparison right. so that's number 1 hmm. that <clears throat> we excluded the covid year and to be fair we also said okay let's take out 2008 which was a global, ah, the global financial crisis right. now coming to the larger point how do you make comparisons mm-hmm. okay so we could start off with okay let's compare with south asia right and then you say but wait a second you know the whole world maybe 30 years ago it made sense to compare india with south asia mm-hmm. now we all globalized absolutely okay so what happens in china affects the rest of the world what happens in india affects the rest of the world and what happens in the us certainly affects the world europe so, i mean all of them yeah so therefore <clears throat> we are globalized Mm-hmm. and therefore the only appropriate analysis if you're comparing the indian regime in post 2014 with prior to that you have to have a comparator now if i had said let's look at east asia then somebody would say a and if i had said south asia then somebody would say b right if i had said only developing countries then somebody would say c so this seemed to be for a short piece which was trying to emphasize mm-hmm. that you cannot compare for any country just period versus period, period. right yeah. so then what were your findings i mean when you when you compare india's growth rates after adjusting it against global growth rates What were your findings about the Modi government versus yeah. UPA? So what we found out <coughs> was that both that during the Modi period that the 
excess growth. So we had a parameter called the excess growth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that is an appropriate metric. And we found that during 2014 to 23, that there was a larger growth in India, average growth, right. than during the earlier period. Okay. Now, you know, it's not a rocket science conclusion. Think about it. Between, and then there's one other point on this, that a rising tide raises, raises all boats. boats. Yeah. Okay. Conversely, a lowering tide lowers all boats. Right. But what we find during the Modi period, especially after COVID, that basically we alone Rose. are growing, whereas the rest of the world is not. Right. So in other words, I think we didn't point that out because one after another, but this is quite unusual that, you know, the only other economy that we knew about this, and, you know, incidentally, there are a lot of questions being raised about Chinese data. Mm -hmm. So when we get to the data, but the only time you've had an economy so divergent from the rest of the world right. is now. And prior to now, it was China. So you yeah. excluded China and then see how things were happening and so on and so forth. So I think this period has been exceptional for India in any objective sense. And the world is recognizing that. So I was at the IMF, etc. And, you know, this is now recognized that, look, there's something happening here. That's, that's different and extraordinary. Yeah. So in a nutshell, if I can say the... Basically, during the UPA years, the world was growing quite strongly. And during that time, India also was growing strongly. But during the Modi period, the world started slowing down, but India yeah, started accelerating. accelerating. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. But now, coming to that point about the growth rates, there's been a lot of criticism about our data, the Indian government's data on things like GDP, uh, things like IIP, CPI, uh, the the census hasn't been released for a long time now. It's overdue. The consumer expenditure survey is overdue by a long time. Both the IIP and CPI, their bases were last set in 2011. So there's a lot of questions about this. And regarding that, actually, we have an audience question from uh, Mr. Uh, Sivaram uh, Pasuvan. He says, given the overall distrust, do you believe in the economic data published by various government of India agencies? If not, how do you cut through the haze to ascertain the true picture? Yeah. Look, <clears throat> the question is, this is what all of us economists have to do. I like the second part of his question, because I've always maintained that the mark of a good economist mm -hmm. is not what she does with good data, is what she does with bad data. Right. So, okay. So this puts on a greater responsibility on us if we think we are good economists to find out what is going on. Right. Now coming to the list of data, you know, the census hasn't been done. Yes. And we've all questioned why. We thought certainly we couldn't do it in the COVID year, mm -hmm. but the year after and the year after and the year after. Right. Absolutely no doubt in my mind that the census is very, very important, has to be done. Then you mentioned the, you started off mentioning with the GDP data. Right. Actually, the GDP data mm -hmm. is probably the best data we have. I see. Because <clears throat> there are various, of the, relatively the best, I'm not saying absolutely. Right. Okay? And I don't think it uses the IIP data that much. Mm -hmm. IIP data is also a disaster area yes. because it hasn't been updated. Uh, updated. Now, you know, one, what I've made the suggestion, and especially for monetary policy, we need to have up-to-date consumption data right. for which we rely on the CES survey, Consumer Expenditure Survey. Right. Now, you know, most countries, and let's take the U.S., which has the state of the art, it's at the frontier, etc. Mm -hmm. First, they have changing weights. So they have surveys, but the weights that they use 
Uh, the surveys go into the construction of the weights and the weights change from year to year. I see. So they don't keep it fixed. The last pair, so they don't have it a, a fixed weight. I'm saying we don't have the data for whatever reason, but we've got the national accounts data, which is goes into the GDP. Right. There you know how much is agriculture. There you know how much is uh, industry. There you know how much is mining. And, you know, it's not that difficult a job. Actually, I had done it mm -hmm. in 2014, 15 and given it to the Gulam Rajan, okay. who was then the R RBI governor, that look, our dates, this is 20, so we had the CES survey, but in a fast changing structural economy, you're not going to be waiting for CES survey to come about. And Every five years or so. Especially if they are bad. Right. Then what are you going to do, which is another. So I, you know, I think this, the statistical system in India, and there have been a lot of other people have made the same point, mm -hmm. though I, I come at it at a slightly different angle. Um, maybe perhaps we can do, you know, I, I'm shocked as to the low quality Mm -hmm. of data and perhaps an equally low quality of analysis of the data. <laughs> I see. So okay. we've got a double whammy problem. Right. That, uh, and, you know, so I think, but the first thing is easily correctable. That is, we can, and, you know, India was at the frontier mm -hmm. uh, way back. And <clears throat> way back, meaning 40 years, 50, 60 years ago, wow. we were at the frontier. After that, even by 2000, 1990 and 2000, we had fallen back in terms of the quality of our data on consumption data. For I example, see. NSS yeah. data. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion about what has happened, etc. So I think something, you know, we can speculate what's happening. The best and the brightest now mm -hmm. go into journalism, <laughs> go to Wall Street, go to the Law Street, etc. Right. Go into business schools, which pay them a lot more. But not the government. But not the government. Right. So what's happening? Maybe, you know, the government needs to either farm out the statistical agencies mm -hmm. outside of the government. Perhaps, and certainly they'll have to give it money, but right. then they're not constrained by, look, he's a joint secretary rank and I've got to give the same rank to 10,000 other people. So bureaucratic. I, no. So basically it can be done. Right. And I hope they do it. But I think, uh, you know, it's a rot. But so uh, you mentioned the bad quality of our data a few times now. Perhaps we can uh, go with an example. So the the 2017-18 consumer expenditure survey hmm. was scrapped by this government and the government said that the quality of data was very poor. Um, but it has since then, the data has been leaked, a lot of people have analyzed it and all of that. So what is your estimation? I mean, one, should the government have scrapped it or released it? And two, the quality of that data? One, it certainly should not have scrapped it. Okay. And it certainly should not have endorsed it because it was truly, truly the worst quality data that I have ever seen. So release and it with caveats? No, no, we don't endorse it. This is the data. And you know, it has happened before. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you recall, in 1987-88, there was a consumer expenditure survey right. and at the same time an employment unemployment survey. Okay, And there was nothing wrong with the consumer expenditure survey, but there was something terribly, terribly wrong with the... I worked on it. Right. I, I worked I, I'm, on I'm it. I'm sorry I laughed. I mean, that was the year I was born. Okay. So. So, <laughs> so the point being, so what the government did was, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. They released the data. Ah, I see. And yeah. so what happened then? I've, I've used the data. Okay. Okay. I've used it and then said, I can't use it. That it's, it's really bad. And that's the government itself decided and other people saw because it was just wild. Okay. So what the government should have done 
we believe this data, they could have hired me, I would have told them, they could have hired you or anybody else, <laughs> you know, and we can go into that as to why that wasn't done. Right. And there's a real politics there. But they should have said, we believe this data is not of a quality mm -hmm. to be released, but we are to be endorsed. Right. It's, we, there's no official report on that data. But, here's but the we data. are, and you go and do what, and let the people find out. And maybe, and you know, I have a twist on this. Maybe the statisticians who were involved in this data mm -hmm. also were recommending not to release it. Because then the world will find out, what were you doing? That's How did this happen? So job, right. So when we say the government, who do we mean? In the, the government clearly said it was terrible data. Right. I have looked at the data and we can talk about it. It is the worst data in the world. Oh, I see. The, the yeah. Consumer Expenditure Survey 2017-18. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's give you an example. Hmm. And this is where, you know, unfortunately, there is not much analysis. Um, and most of the, I've seen about four or five published studies that use the data and don't question any of its content okay. because of the leaked data. We know right. the distribution, etc. Mm -hmm. And keep on saying, you know, the government didn't release the data because it showed, and this is what the data showed in 1718, that average per capita real consumption had declined by 5%. Right. That is what the data shows. Right. Right. And these very same scholars wrote volumes on it. Right. Saying this is what the reality is. And the government is not doing it because, you know, it's done such a terrible job of managing the economy. And it doesn't want right? to admit it. Yeah. Right. Now think about it. That 5% decline is over 2011-12, right. not over the previous year. Yeah, it's since... To so, therefore, therefore, you have that basically we didn't grow at all for six years. Yeah. And in the seventh year, maybe we declined. Right. Right? Now, four of those years were under the, the UPA. The UPA. Yeah. Number one. Number two. Okay, so keep politics out there. The data is so bad. Assume that basically during the UPA period, there was normal growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, because this is politics. The reason I'm bringing in the UPA, because these very same scholars don't question uh, right. the data. You know, I've done this calculation. It meant that there was, if, if they had grown normally and then... For, for Suddenly an Modi there, comes It was 28% decline. As soon Never as Modi in the came. world has there been, you do the normal, every year right. we are growing, consumption is growing at about 3%, 4%, 5%, okay? And then there is, a, so you're at 100, right. and you should have been at 140 mm -hmm. in 2016-17, uh, mm -hmm. before the survey, right. and you now fall to 95. Yeah, that does not make sense. Huh, to, why haven't you seen this? Anybody saying that it Anybody doesn't make Anybody saying sense. this? Right. No, worse, using it and saying this data shows this is the case. That's what is shocking. But we don't even see the, I mean, so the government has not released the data, it has not endorsed the data, but there are no officials even off the record saying that this is such terrible data or... I know. So even the government should maybe step up its activities. So that's what I said in the big look. Who, how, first of all, we you know we we started the discussion with global growth and this and right. That. You know we no longer an island. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know if we ever were, but you know news travels everything. The whole world is looking. So why? <clears throat> I mean. What I find very difficult to understand is here was something so obviously off. Right. The politics said that those people 
who believe uh, that <clears throat> pigs do fly and sometimes <laughs> they dive and therefore things can happen. And then there's a government which is embarrassed by this data. Right. Okay. And by the quality of his data. So why and the statisticians who are responsible for their data, to the best of my knowledge, have been promoted. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me give you, you know, a major scholar, Pranab Sen, who's, mm -hmm. you know, now in 2019, the government announced that we're going to do a committee to look at this data. Yes. Okay. Have you seen any reports? Nothing yet. Huh? How many years have gone by? Five. Five. In 2023, Punab Sen, there's another committee exactly the same yes. set up by the government. Right. Has there been a single discussion? Has there been a single analysis? So, you know, I don't know what's going on. Right. So there's just a big mess up around data right now. Is, yeah. is and we have to look at, you know, follow the money, as they say. We have to look at who's losing out and who's gaining by the non-release of the data. Who is gaining? The opposition, for one thing. Without, uh, I, I guess, yes. <laughs> so, actually, now coming back to politics a little bit, the other question that has been going back and forth between the opposition and the center is this talk about subsidies versus revdi. So, what to you is the difference between the two? No, there's a large difference. You know, and this is again uh, in the Indian literature talked about a lot and there was merit subsidies there are good mm -hmm. subsidies and there are bad subsidies right so let's take the good subsidies for education mm -hmm. that's a good subsidy um, for health that's a good subsidy um, now <clears throat> there's a subsidy for um, uh, chulas or for LPG LPG that's a good subsidy right uh, a subsidy for the building of toilets that's mm -hmm. a very good subsidy. Right. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so I think it is, public policy is in the analysis and the, the statement or in the study right. not of what is a good subsidy and what is not. So I'm not in the camp. There shouldn't be any subsidy. So what is a Devdi? Revdi is a bad subsidy. Now, what's a bad subsidy? For example, <clears throat> we had and some a subsidy that leaks is what I would say is a bad subsidy mm -hmm. or a subsidy that should go to somebody uh, who should not be getting it. Right. That's a Revdi. For example, now a very popular subsidy or oh, in Delhi, you know, uh, women will be given free bus tickets, but right. not men. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know why <clears throat> the transportation? Um, now I guess it is done with the idea that you will have uh, more women entering the labor force. I don't know what the thinking was, but it seemed like you know a popular thing to do. Right. So what I'm saying is that the subsidy has to be looked at. Does it lead? And you know. Actually, I should bring that. for centuries, it's been recognized this is a public good. Mm -hmm. A public good is something that is has to be made available to all. Right. Okay. So, in many instances, the subsidy is just, for example, now you have on climate, this, that, a subsidy to improve the climate. You bring out pollution, it hurts everybody else. So there are many subsidies. If they have a merit at the end of it, there is a productivity enhancement at the end of it. Right. And it doesn't hurt the incentive system. Mm -hmm. That's broadly a good subsidy. Okay. A subsidy for the sake of getting votes is a devdi. So I'm glad you actually mentioned that because... Uh for a long time, this government was very effectively targeting its uh, LPG subsidies to the Ujwala Yojana. 
Then last year around Rakhi time, it expanded the LPG subsidy to absolutely everybody. So, in your estimation, would you say that this has moved from a subsidy to a RFD? Yeah, I look, I, there, there's no justification uh, <clears throat> for. I, I think what the prime minister recently announced um, that he would give a subsidy for uh, the rooftops, the uh, the rooftop solar. Yeah, right. Now that's a very good subsidy. Right, and that should be given to all. Right, or maybe not actually. Actually, I. Let me let me take that. It should be given to all, mm-hmm. um, but it, that's a very good subsidy right. to achieve the same thing. So to take your thing to expand it to everybody, there's no justification. Matter of fact, you know, let's take. <clears throat> I mean, this rot started a long time ago. Remember the Food Security Act? Yes. Okay. The Food Security Act was 2013. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I guess the government passed that act because they thought elections were around the corner. We are taking care of the security of the people, giving right. them food. So let's pass the Food Security Act, which they did. What were the contours of that act? That people, that 75% of rural India should get the subsidized the food. food. Right. And 50% of urban India, basically two thirds of the population, right. according to the government, was dirt poor, needed food. Yeah. Okay. As it happened, both the PDS system um, <clears throat> and the Narega system, I have investigated or researched and published papers. They were the leakiest, <laughs> yes, most corrupt. Let's be clear. Hmm. Uh, public policies that the world has ever seen, right? And remember, and it's not me. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi said it in 1984, 85, when he said only 15 paise of the money that the government spends in the name of the poor mm-hmm. actually gets to the poor. He said it way back then. Way back then. Right. So this is an age old, you know, so what has changed now? So right now we have the food and I think the expansion of the food subsidy in the COVID year was excellent. One. Right. But I really don't see why two thirds of the population should be getting free food. Again, 81 crore people for the next five years. Yeah. So the PM, the PM, um, to be fair, the PM has defended it saying that uh, basically these are people that have recently come out of poverty. And so even a doctor, when somebody just comes back home from hospital, I, then... Absolutely, but it's not two thirds of the population. It's not such a it's large 755 number. 755 million. Okay. Who are getting it. So. Right. You know, there is a, <clears throat> I will give one defense of the food subsidy. And that is that increasingly, you know, there is what was much talked about by the economists of the basic income. So you I, want, you know, it's a fantastic <clears throat> welfare enhancing if targeted well. The universal so I think basic if they, income. Huh? The universal basic income. Yeah. UBI, this right? is like a universal basic income. Right. Okay. I mean, a good solid, you know, at least your food is taken care of. Yeah. And I think housing is a very good, you were asking about good subsidies. Yeah. Housing is a terribly good subsidy. So, you know, but I think we need to, uh, so if, if that was the argument given, I would mm-hmm. go along with but then we've targeted and you know and then it's not so not so off as a basic income you're giving it the point is here the whole story is targeting right and then now thanks to uh, all the stuff modern technology etc that that little gimmick that everything everybody yeah, yeah. has uh, you can do things that were not possible before between Aadhaar and UPI and the banking system, basically under uh, 
the Jandhan Yojana, yeah. the everybody having a bank account or virtually yeah. everybody having a bank account, that's helped in targeting. Yeah, yeah. and but on <clears throat> coming back to the food subsidy, um, you know, na daega bans na baje ki bansui. We had the whole elaborate system mm -hmm. of minimum support price. Right. So you want to get to why is it still hanging over our head? Is the minimum support price for farmers? So now, if you say, listen, given that I have a minimum support price for farmers, what do I do? Then the food subsidy is not a bad idea. You buy it from them, and 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 it's you know, the the DBT is now three percent of GDP. Yes, and most of it is very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, there is a, I think the ultimate answer here of analysis is that, is it efficient and transparent? Right. If it's efficient and transparent, it really, people see it, people will applaud it, and there's very little basis for criticism. And you can judge whether it's actually being useful or productive or yeah. not. And now... And take the food subsidy. What is happening? As everybody knows, that the people who shouldn't be getting it are getting it. That enhances their income. And they sell that food. Yes. And then buy or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's an income transfer. Um, and it's not... But I think if we didn't have PDS... Um, maybe we'll have a different welfare and even a more efficient one. Here, right. the farmers, you know, it's complicated, but so all, all I oh, want to say is I don't want to come out right. saying, you know, I'm not against subsidies. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm, I'm for efficient subsidies. Let's put it up. All right. And uh, okay, so now uh, we have another question uh, from the audience. Uh, this is Bab Kamath who asks, this is about unemployment now, another vexatious issue. He asks, uh, what realistic action can a government take to increase employment in rural and other sectors of the country where there is chronic unemployment, in, in their words, in a growing economy with a 7 plus uh, percentage uh, growth rate? Okay. So it's very interesting, uh, this viewer um, accepts the GDP data. Mm -hmm. but is somehow not accepting the PLFS employment data because if he or she, I don't know. <coughs> they. If, yeah. I had looked at the unemployment data. The unemployment in India today is somewhere around 4%. Okay. So where there is, and <coughs> so that's first of all, um, we don't have, and the economy, where what uh, the Modi government inherited, had 5% unemployment. So okay. they all point to, in 2011, mm -hmm. that the unemployment rate was 3.3%, 3, 3 right. not realizing that it had steadily been going up. So that's point number one. Number two, there is unemployment or perceived unemployment amongst the youth and the youth and it's higher mm -hmm. and indeed this is a problem around the world so i was born in a lucky generation okay okay and you were born in a slightly getting to be unlucky <laughs> generation and the youngsters here are born in a generation where globally there is excess supply. Absolutely. We all, right, your dad, all of us went and said, go forth and educate. Yes. Because we had benefited so much from education individually right. that it seemed like a very good idea. And I think it's morally a good idea mm -hmm. that you have to enhance education. So the whole world went and expanded. Yeah. I'll give you a simple statistic. In 1996, there were 50 million college graduates in the advanced countries, 50 million flow. Okay. And there was 55 or 60 million flow 
in the developing countries. This right. is all to plug my book, The New Wealth of Nations. Okay, right. I'll just publish it. But yeah, I mean, I love this uh, analysis, and I, even if I did it myself. So what has happened over the years, the last 25 years, that 50 million in the advanced countries has gone up to 60 million. Okay. The 50 million in the rest of the world has gone up to 300 million. I see. Okay. All competing for the same few jobs. jobs. Yeah. Or fewer jobs or whatever you want. That's the, this is it. China is now refusing to publish its data mm -hmm. for about three or four months about unemployment of youth. Right. In India's case, and this is something that I have studied a lot, what happens? And this is, you know, you want to talk about a reform, let's reform the government security job system. Ah, right. So everybody wants a government job. Yes. Okay, it has a string of benefits like no other. So therefore, Everybody applies, you know, you, and uh, my leftist friends, oh, look, there are 20,000 applicants for a clerk job or whatever. Look at the data. As starting at the age of 30, and this is something that has gone on for the last 40 years in India. Mm -hmm. You look at the unemployment data, goes down to 2%, 1.5% for everybody above the age of 29. Really? Yes. That's interesting. Okay. Whether now or in 2017 or in 2011, there's a complete falling off from 25 to 29. There's a gradual decline and boom. So around because what 30, people do. Right. This is waiting. They do. And here's the other thing. You know, people are not sitting at home twiddling their thumbs. Mm -hmm. And especially not the women anymore, though we'll have surveys would tell us that only 8% of the women in India are employed or in the labor force. I mean, we should talk about that sometime right. as to why, how people get. So, you know, so the youngsters are working. So what happens at 30? How do they suddenly no, no. I mean, the data just shows. No, no. Right. It's just that they now know they're out of sync. Though I think it's going to get better. And I'll tell you why it's going to get better. So the, the logic is you got a job. You graduated, you mm -hmm. got a job, you're doing well, up, 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 in a way. You don't, you're not doing so well, you don't get a job, you do A, B, and C. Right. And where A, the capital A is government. So you apply, yeah. apply, apply, no reply, right? Yes. So you apply to the government and then you give up and then you say, okay, I've got to continue with my life. Right. So then you take whatever job. You can get. You can get, but mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So, I mean, it's a, but now, so anyway, so I think this thing is, there is a huge, it does, it's not there in the data, I'm telling you. There is no, like the unemployment problem is not it's, as big as people are saying. It's not as big, but for the youth, it is. Okay. It is, I mean, it's like 10% or whatever. Youth unemployment, it's yeah. 10%. Yeah. Okay. I think maybe 9, 10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Though they are, <clears throat> some of my colleagues are saying it's 25% because they're looking at uh, CMIE data. But basically, no. There is, for the youth, it's higher. And for the youth, it's higher in every country in the world, except for the US. Right. It's okay, France, Germany, take any country, Brazil, advanced, developing, whatever. And it has got to do with this. A huge expansion in supply of skilled or educated labor. I see. That's the that's uneducated, the less educated. They are not unemployed. The educated tend to be from upper classes, so on and so forth. So they can afford to be unemployed right. or whatever. So, you know, I mean, <clears throat> the poor are too poor not to work. Absolutely. Uh, so now coming to another government policy, which they were quite proud of when they announced it, which is their privatization, the public sector enterprises policy. Basically, they said that in strategic sectors, they'll maintain a minimum presence. And in every other sector, they're going to exit. That exit would be through disinvestment or through closures. 
But the thing is that they've uh, they announced it in 2020, and since then they've moved very slowly on it. Uh, instead, they have been. But we have Air India. But there is Air India. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's a mega achievement. It is true. They've been trying for a long time yeah. and okay. getting it. But on the other side, they've been focusing more on getting dividends from the profit making making companies. And there seems to now be a balancing act between dividends and disinvestment. Do you think this is the right way forward? Look, <laughs> this is, um, again, uh, an international issue. And a lot of my friends and your friends um, didn't believe in industrial policy before. And mm -hmm. now leading economists are coming out uh, that every, you know, country should have an industrial policy. The U.S. has an industrial policy. Right. Okay. So what is happening is, again, competition, international competition. Okay. So, you know, that's why there has been a rise in protection uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> lowering of protection makes a lot of sense when the whole tide is rising. Right. Now, when the tide is going down, the political pressures... Um, are enormous domestic political pressures. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, this is like taxation that, uh, you know, we now have an international agreement on taxation. Um, you know, there's a, and I guess what I keep stressing in this talk or in this interview is the world is very different today right. than at least when I went to college. Mm -hmm. And even, and, and I think it started to change somewhere around between 2000 and 2010. Um, so we cannot use, I don't have the perfect model or the most appropriate model to look at events and to look at uh, economies today. But what I'm very confident of that the old tools uh, not useless, but do not help much. But by old tools, would you mean public sector companies? I, including public sector companies, including public sector companies. I see. Now, there are public sector companies like hotels. Right. Why should the government be in hotels? Absolutely. Um, doesn't make any sense. So I think like we were talking about waveries, good subsidies and bad subsidies, mm -hmm. um, that you know, the government can, and especially since I, I want to emphasize this global competition is uh, really affecting every country. Um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. was a disguised way of protecting their own industry. So, um, you know, this is a, it deserves a lot of study. It's not uh, those of us who believed in free trade and still do, mm -hmm. um, and competition, it's bothersome. Right. Um, but there is, uh, there is some substance to it, um, or some logic to it, not substance, some logic okay. to why it's happening. And I As think, in why, why they're going slow on disinvestment? Yeah, or? I mean, <clears throat> I don't know, actually. Let me put it this way. Look, as I said, the uh, Air India should have been privatized. The hotel should be privatized. You know, we have uh, things like cement and, you know, all these things were part of the government. Um, there's no logic. The government shouldn't be in the business of making watches. Uh, so um, I would look at steel as another story. Uh, so there, there are some strategic sectors of the government. So, uh, I mean, like you need to have a state bank of India. Yeah. You need to have a government well, banking not, presence. Not so sure. But no? anyway, though I think no. But what I would say is that given, uh, I think bank nationalization was a terrible idea. Right. Okay. But given that there and given the change world, um, that I think we have, one, we have too many banks in India. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, what the government has signaled, attempted, you know, we'll have five uh, state banks. Right. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but uh, 
you know, I don't think we can get to the stage. So I think, yes, the State Bank of India is a good thing. Right. Um, so that that's what I'm trying to emphasize, that look, we are in a changed world. Um, I, w- I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago, 10 years right. ago. Um, so, you know, uh, yes, uh, I think, again, we have the opportunity to examine uh, now in the international context, there's so much information, so much analysis, uh, you know, back 30 years ago, you were groping the dark, but now we do have information. And um, I think we can look at these sectors analytically Mm -hmm. um, and we have all the tools to examine uh, whether they should be in that sector or not. Right. Okay. But uh, less government is is better. Is better. Is right. So now you also mentioned this intense uh, competition now across countries. Coming to foreign direct investment, I I also have analyzed the story. I I, I mean, analyzed the data and I did a story for the print. But basically, the recent data is quite uh, is quite alarming in terms of how low the FDI levels have been for India in the first six months of the financial year. We got only about $10 billion, which takes us back to about 2007-8. As a percentage of GDP, it's fallen to 1%, which takes us back to 2005-06. No, no, don't do percentage of GDP. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Just do... The absolute. Yeah. And okay. what I would do, I, uh, since you've done the study, I haven't looked at it. I would look at the flows to other countries. Exactly. So our share in global G, uh, in a global FDI inflows, yeah, yeah. that's also fallen. It's taken us back, not so far back, but to 2017 levels. So where is it going? It's not going to China. It's going, it seems, to South Korea and Vietnam. A well, lot Vietnam of it. Vietnam is, is a big success story. Right. And South Korea, that's interesting. So, uh, related to that, I had an audience question from Lieutenant General Rajan Singh Grewal, who is the professor and head of dermatology at MM University at Ambala. He asks a simple question, which is, how do we enhance foreign investments? (laughs) Well, uh, you must have looked at it since you did, as to why it has fallen. Um, We know... Why, what are the reasons it will fall? I think retrospective taxation would be um, one of the issues. Uh, regulations of the government uh, would be another issue. Whether they can repatriate capital would be another issue. Um, one issue that uh, some of the analysts mentioned to me was particularly the Modi government's decision to cancel all of the bilateral investment treaties because this gave companies protection from litigation and arbitration within India. The bilateral investment treaties basically said that all of the arbitration would happen in a third country. So they saw it as being fair. But now without the bits, all of it's happening in India and the companies aren't comfortable. And second... Uh, India's push for new free trade agreements, Yeah, they say is that these companies can get access to our markets without having to invest here. So, you know, these issues... Yeah, I think my gut reaction, um, the second one doesn't, is the first one right. uh, that I would be bothered about. So clearly, there is a problem. You know, I mean, I'll tell you another problem, which whether it affected FDI or not, uh, the government came out with a bright idea that they were going to tax any spending by Indians on credit cards overseas. Abroad, yes. Okay. This, and this. I think it is a tax. I mean, the government says, no, 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 we'll... I mean, uh, that is a tax collected at source and it will be offset. <laughs> offset. Yeah. You know, and I did a calculation. They, the government makes very little money out of it. Mm. Uh, so trivial that it's not even worth remembering. So why was it done? And thankfully, they went back on it. They went back on it. They've forgotten about it. But you know, look, we are a large country with diverse 
opinions and all. And somehow, you know, some of them make it to the top in terms of policy <laughs> and uh, are not uh, killed in the bud. So, sometimes good ideas win out. Sometimes good ideas win out. Right. Um, so I think uh, this foreign investment, I, I do see um, it has to do, just my training would tell me that you're putting some blocks in the way. Uh, the whole world, most of the world wants to encourage, makes, make it easier for foreigners to come because, you know, uh, you want their capital, etc. Right. And, and, you know, I would say along the same, why are we doing our exchange rate? Mm -hmm. uh, we are accumulating reserves. Yes. You know, that's another. Uh, so, But basically. the government boasts about it, says that this is a good thing that our reserves are going up. Well, no, there are two things. <clears throat> Again, globally, now I've done a study. Our, reserve, our reserves to import ratio mm -hmm. is somewhere around 96%. Okay. 96 percentile. There are very oh, few in countries the, I see. who have this. So I think, yes, reserves are a good thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is something called too much reserves. Right. So that's my, and that will allow the rupee to appreciate if they didn't, that will allow foreigners to give, have a greater incentive to produce over here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, I mean, it's a, you want, look, the goal has to be that you want the most efficient production and you want to reward whoever is willing uh, to provide you with good, efficient production. Right. Okay. At, by efficient, I mean at globally competitive prices. You right. want to do that. So if FDI is not coming in at the same rate as before, it is a, a warning signal that something is not working. Okay. And uh, okay, now this is uh, my final question. It kind of sums up the discussion. The government, of course, has been vocal about all of the strengths of the economy, and there are several. But we're coming up to elections, and there will be a new government that takes over, whether it is the, the Modi government again, hmm. or a new government. I mean, that only the elections will tell us. But a new government will take charge. What to you are some of the challenges in the economy that it must tackle head on? Well, <clears throat> we've talked about a lot of the challenges. I'll start off with the data. Right. <laughs> that, uh, the more informed you are, mm -hmm. um, the better the economy. So for me, um, how can you operate in the dark and say something is good or something is bad? We need this, we don't need that. So I think we need better data. Um, all the time we need to strive for more competition. Okay. So that improves efficiency. Um, so I would <clears throat> encourage that. I think the government is doing a pretty good job in terms of taking care of the bottom 50, 60 percent. We talked right. about that. Yes. Um, oh, I, I'll tell you one, my favorite recommendation um, is to cut tax rates. <laughs> so. Right. We, we don't are, love that. We, no, no. I mean, we talked about reserves. I don't know how many people know. And, you know, I mean, there are too many, um, or I was going to say leftists, but I don't know. But our tax rate, now let me define that. A total collection of taxes in India, mm -hmm. state as well as center. And direct and indirect both. And direct and all, all taxation. Okay. Not Okay. All taxation mm -hmm. is somewhere around 19% of GDP. Okay. But what do our economists say? Oh, you know, they only look at the center and that's 11 or 12 or whatever it is. So I think, um, and we have done a pretty good job in terms of um, ease of taxation now, uh, direct taxes. But, you know, tax rates need to be cut. Um, in order to incentivize further, uh, since we are already, um, you know, there must be something going on that amongst, if you take out the advanced countries, mm -hmm. and especially those that have uh, a large amount of social security, we are one of the highest in the world. So it's a small fraction 
that is paying, but actually it's not a small fraction. That's another myth because the GST, everybody, everybody pays. is paying. Yeah. So I think GST rates need to be cut. We're collecting too much GST. Mm -hmm. And I think the income tax rates, direct income, corporate tax was reformed. That's a good thing. Okay. But you know, that's the whole problem. You have a corporate tax rate at 25%. And you have personal income tax rates all the way from 30 to 42 percent. So lots of incentives yeah. to not. So why isn't that? And actually, you know, this is another, I hope this, you all, since you asked what one of the first things they should do right. is this. Um, I, is, mean, I think all of us would love it if they cut tax rates. But they need to. Right. But uh, on that note, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating yeah. discussion. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.